Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being with us here today and on streaming. It's a hot day here in Madrid. So, well, here we are protected by a uh, very good AC system at uh, Telefonica Foundation. I encourage you to, to come with us. Um, I'm Carmen Morenes. I'm the man general manager of uh, Fundación Telefonica, and I would like to welcome you on this new uh, Tech and Society cycle that we host with Aspen since 2017. I would like to say hello to Jose Maria Arailza, the General Secretary of Aspen Institución Spain, William Powers, CEO and founder of Public Minds, who is with us today, and uh, our colleague Chema Alonso, who is the Chief Digital Officer of Telefonica. So since the beginning of this uh, cycle, and of this work that we conduct together with Aspen, we wanted to create a space for reflection and discussion in a relaxed way and in a deep way where we can see the expectations and consequences digitalization is bringing to our lives. And what we've learned during the last years is that we've suffered different crises that you all know, one after the other, the pandemic, the war, issues that were totally unexpected. So we think that such a forum is more meaningful than ever. And I think that it's important because it is time to look for consensus, for agreement. It is time to work actively all together. It's time for reflection. It's time to reflect about the quick consequences that the digital transformation is entailing. And this is creating opportunities. As our chairman says, it's not the time of technology. We have more, the, more technology than ever, but it's time of humanism to create values, to apply these values on uh, technology development, to set boundaries. And the boundaries have to be the people people's well-being. So the meeting that we have today, the edition for 2022, is a great example of how to reflect about these limits, what is in our hands in order to create a more uh, fair society, a more equal society, and technology always has to set bridges in order to create a uh, more equal system, uh, more democratic systems, and we need a tool that helps us eradicate the imbalances in society. And in many cases, they are expanding, and we need to put the focus on them in order to work on them and to close these gaps that affect us all. We hope that these four editions are really inspiring, stimulating and help us uh, reflect, to uh, rethink. We are in a moment of how to um, tackle these needs that we have with these hasty changes that we have in society and this uh, humanistic technology that we all trust uh, that will, will bring uh, solutions to many uh, uh, to many of the problems. So I give the floor to Jose Maria Darenza for, for him to, to address some words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. I'm Jose Maria Danenza. I'm General Secretary of um, Instituto Aspen, Spain. And it's a great pleasure to run, uh, to start this uh, sixth edition of Tech and Society that helps us think what society we want, how we can strengthen democracy through uh, digital technology, how we face these challenges that are set by change, how we civilize the progress, um, how we make it be useful for everybody uh, so that these values that hold our living together can be reaffirmed instead of living in a world with more risks and more threats. So, luckily, we have Bill Powers with us today. He is a friend from Aspen Institute for many years. He has moderated workshops here in Spain, in Japan, uh, with different uh, initiatives from Aspen. He is a journalist that has been doing so for many years. He worked with Bob Woodwork in, uh, at Washington Post, and he created the technology section at the Post. And he had the he uh, wrote a bestseller that we will speak about to see how at different moments of history the excess of information has in has led to revolutions and how technology has been used in order to civilize this change to take advantage of this revolution and to make it have social um, positive consequences. Um, he has worked in uh, MIT lab as. Um, as a, as a guest uh, for six years, and we told him, we you have to come to Tech Society to explain all this. And we were combining words, algorithms, and responsibility. We were starting to measure the impact of algorithms on democracy, and we have to do it in a constructive way, with that faith, in the sense that, as Chema Alonso says, moving the boundaries, being bold to accept change, but also focusing it on values, we all win. So, we will start with, um, 
with some of Bill's ideas in a minute. Bill and Gemma will start um, a conversation that I will moderate, but it's about having a conversation with you all and with people that are following us on streaming. Hey, on no okay thank you very much for the introductions and i'm thrilled to be here thank you all for coming this evening to hear us speak about um a particular idea that i'm working on but the the it's part of this much larger conversation the world is having that i know chema is a big part of which is bringing human values to our digital lives and to society and really taking not just talking about it but taking action my experience speaking here and just my activities that i've had with great pleasure over the years um, with the aspen institute of spain have been mostly about talking about ideas and thinking that maybe they can be executed somehow we would have great conversations and i would go back to writing and doing my science work and so forth this is different this time is different because i'm going to talk about an actual project that i'm leading to bring into the world a new idea a new technology into the world to hopefully begin to solve one of these problems we are living through a it feels like a treacherous time for democracy and this idea grew out of a project as jose said that um, i worked on during my time at mit with my team uh, where we realized that everybody in our democracy in the united states potentially has a voice in the new public square which is online and yet we're not hearing most of those voices and this is in 2015 2016 so seven seven years ago about um, we had a presidential election starting up when we decided that we would use our ability with algorithms and basically social media listening techniques that my lab had developed over the years to try and listen to all the voices in the election campaign that were speaking up on one platform to which we had been given special access which was twitter jack dorsey the former ceo of twitter was a great fan of our lab he had supported us for years earlier and they decided to give us all their data absolutely everything for a year um, including data that we normally would have no lab had access to and also every tweet going back to the very first tweet when twitter was founded so that we could begin to look at the people who were talking about this election in the United States and try and isolate the narratives that were developing about all the different topics that were under discussion so health care climate change and so forth all these important questions and see what we found out basically and automate it so it would be a very intelligent machine that would allow our team to do articles and analyses that we would publish in collaboration with the Washington Post my old employer CNN many other partners and hopefully elucidate the conversation about the election so it had more success than we expected we got a lot of attention for our work and we were invited to be at the final four presidential debates between hillary clinton and donald trump giving suggested questions to the, m the moderators of those four debates they had never had scientists or a tech team at those debates before so that was exciting for us um it was a difficult election as you know it was very much about personalities and it was an ugly election but we felt we had a small role in showing that there might be a new path forward for democracy and technology so um with that i would like to go to my here we go to my slide deck and so what i'm sharing with you now so i have uh, i have an initiative now called public mind which is what i'm really here to talk about which is a nonprofit that i have founded with a few colleagues who we realized sort of together that this machine we built back in 2016 at the MIT Media Lab had special relevance to this moment that we're living through and that we could put it to use in society because of what's happened with these bubbles that we are all part of these sort of closed conversations in social media where we're not hearing each other anymore we're just getting isolated into ideological sort of clubs as it were closed worlds of ideology is there a way to follow the conversation humans are having around the world on social platforms not just twitter but many other platforms and so that we can hear all the voices so all of us can hear all the voices or at least track them as a way of understanding the public mind the way the public is thinking as you know polls used to have this 
function in society, but polling is a kind of a broken science now. It may recover, but right now when we look at polls in the United States, we do not necessarily trust what the polls are telling us because the polls don't seem to be very good at predicting elections and other things that they used to be good at. And so we view listening to the social voices closely at scale and isolating important topics of our time, climate change, pandemic, all these things we're talking about now could be a step forward for the new public square, as we call it. So it's a nonprofit, as I said, and we spent some time fundraising. And I'm going to share with you now the slideshow that we used when we were fundraising. So that we wanted foundations, individual philanthropists to support us. It ultimately succeeded and we were, were funded. We are now moving forward with about to begin building the technology. And so what you're going to see are the slides that allowed us to sell the idea, basically, to people who believed in it. So I think this will bring up the slides. Can we start the slide deck now? There we go. Yeah, yeah, I have to go back. There it is, public mind, mapping the voices of modern democracy. That is our mission in one sentence. We believe democracy depends on a healthy square. I hope that you all agree with that as well. These are the public squares of the past, ancient times, sort of 17th century England, coffee houses, and today, the public square of technology that we all participate in. This is where the future of society is debated and shaped. 3.6 billion people around the world are on major social media platforms. They're speaking up on the urgent issues of our time, as I said. But the new public sphere, square is dysfunctional. It's not working for positive good. It's not working constructively. Citizen voices are not reaching the democratic institutions that need to hear them. Some voices are reaching those institutions, as you know. They tend to be big influencers with big followings, people who have very ideological agendas, not the voices of the citizens writ large. The result, social disintegration and a loss of trust. And in fact, in the U.S., trust in the federal government has been at historic lows for the last decade and now stands at 20%. Only 20% of Americans trust the federal government. Obama, in his book, uh, noting that our discourse is broken, said that the the single biggest threat to our democracy. I don't know about you, but when I was living through the wonderful high times of the early 21st century and was so optimistic about technology, I never thought I would hear a president of the United States say that the internet is a threat to democracy. I agree, though, that it is, and that now is the time to fix it. P other people have noted something that our startup is sort of based on, which is the idea that you don't have to you don't have to rely on polls for the public mind. That there are new ways of measuring public opinion and tracking it over time. And as this article in Axios noted, other measures like social media may give us a window into enthusiasm and populations that polls are missing. We need to start realizing that what people say on Facebook and in comment sections is what they actually mean. And so this was kind of. One one of those articles I read that got me thinking about this technology that we had built at MIT earlier, and maybe it had a new purpose in the world. And the question we asked ourselves was, what if digital technologies could strengthen democracy rather than eroding it? The same scientific advances that enabled this vibrant conversation, basically computer science, can now be used to discern the opinions and aspirations that it reflects for social good. So public mind is all about elevating citizen voices, all the voices, as many of them as we can possibly identify, and reinvigorating public discourse for a healthier, more democratic, more truly democratic society. Our goals include generating a comprehensive, empirical, real-time picture of public opinion, reconnecting citizen voices to the to news media, power centers, and change agents for a more responsive democracy, because those are the entities that we'll be sharing our work with initially. We have longer aspirations of having an app that everyone could have on their phone and other direct delivery to citizens, but for the moment, we'll be going through these channels. And the ultimate goal also is we feel that we might be able to play a role in rethinking the technology itself, rethinking the digital public sphere, sphere so it works more effectively. 
So this is the video that, um, that was made about the project at, elect at MIT that I mentioned. It was called the Electome. It was a very powerful AI machine that pulled in all of Twitter every day, the entire Firehost, and then divided it up into topics, which you can barely see on there, but uh, that we measured the conversations around these topics. So healthcare climate change, so forth. There were 20-something topics that we tracked for a year and reported in articles we collaborated with the media outlets on. So if we could go to the video now, you'll get the story of um, the Electome. It's a six-minute video, six and a half minutes, that I hope you enjoy. Ready for the video. Election coverage has become more and more like sports coverage. Who's winning and who's losing? Polls, electoral counts, delegates, fundraising, advertising, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is really interesting to consume for all of us, except it's not great for a democracy. The Electome is a platform that we created to analyze the public sphere conversation about issues in this election campaign. Deb Roy runs the lab. We had probably around a dozen people between data scientists, technologists, and journalists in very close collaboration with each other. Journalists think that the point of social media is to push out messages, their own articles and comments, and also for other people to push out prominent people they cover, politicians and so forth, particularly on Twitter. And they haven't really gotten involved in looking at social media and Twitter in particular as a new way of getting a readout on the public, of pulling actually a view of society and of people's opinions. This struck us as a promising alternative or new way of doing quote unquote polling. The laboratory at Social Machines at MIT, our lab, uh, has a unique access to the full Twitter firehose. We are the only lab in the U.S., actually in the world, that has access to the Twitter firehose. What that means is that we have access to every single tweet ever made, going back to the beginning of Twitter. What the Electum does is it analyzes the Twitter conversation around the U.S. election using advances in natural language processing, using deep neural networks. We are able to filter the billions of tweets that we have access to down to only those tweets that are about the U.S. election. Furthermore, we could divide those tweets into topics of interest. So not only can we tell whether a tweet is about the U.S. election, but also whether it's about a particular topic, immigration, guns, you know, women's rights, uh, things like that. On a weekly basis, uh, the system retrains itself to learn new phrases and terms that have entered the conversation about the election. This is very important because, especially for the election, the conversation changes so much. And uh, in order to really capture the whole conversation on Twitter, you need the system to adapt and learn. It was an important goal not to make this a merely academic exercise whose results were known months after the fact. So we were determined all along to publish along the way and share our findings with as large a public as possible. To do that, we linked up with a group of media partners, including the Washington Post, uh, CNN's politics app, Fusion and others. Um, we also published ourselves on the Medium publishing platform. We actually were a tech partner for the Commission on Presidential Debates, providing briefing books and even suggested questions based on our data uh, for the debate moderators. Uh, we even ended up creating an exhibit for the museum in Washington, uh, showing which candidates were associated with which issues over the course of the campaign. We did a story with the Washington Post. We looked at a poll that they ran during one week in March, and then we compared that to the issues that people were talking about in their own voices, otherwise sort of unwatched, unfiltered on Twitter. So in this poll where people self-reported to a pollster based off of the questions that they asked, uh, the number one most important issue was the economy, but we found that that barely registered on Twitter. On Twitter, people were actually talking about issues like foreign policy and national security and racial issues, um, which suggests each provides a different picture of the issues that are important to the electorate. This shows from our dashboard that in the week leading up to Election Day, 
Trump dominated the conversation. About 84% of all tweets about the election were about Donald Trump. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. She congratulated us. It's about us. Once the results came in, we went back to our data and we found some surprising and powerful results. Twitter was giving off signals that it would have been very valuable to know before the election. The electome found that the issues that dominated this election conversation were what we called fear and strife issues. So foreign policy, national security, threats from abroad, internal threats, terrorists, immigration, which was framed by Trump as a kind of a fear issue, and then third guns, which obviously is a fear and strife issue. The normal kind of bread and butter issues that are traditionally dominant in an election, economy, jobs, domestic issues, health care, were not among the leaders this time, which was, which was really unusual and tells you a lot about the times in which we live. Many of the tweets about Trump obviously were negative. People concerned about him, horrified by him, and so forth. But when you looked at the people who were already on his side, we isolated this large group of nine million people by election day who exclusively followed Trump, did not follow Hillary. And those people spoke up in much greater numbers and had much greater enthusiasm for their candidate consistently in all situations, including when he was in trouble. The success of the electome analysis has bigger implications than just analyzing the political sphere. Uh, the fact is this semantic analysis for algorithms to read giant amounts of data and make sense of that could be valuable in multiple other areas of study, including things that are going on in the lab. Uh, we have a food project looking at the whole information ecosystem around food uh, which is drawing on some of the same technology and we're just beginning to think about the implications around the world for other things that it can do. I think what's clear about the electome is that technology and specifically in, in the form of social media has given everybody a voice to be heard and we now have the technology to hear them at scale and really understand what they're saying. So the way that we rebirthed to this idea and brought it back into the world is that, um, and I'll continue with the slideshow after I tell this brief story. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine in the small town in Massachusetts where I live who is involved in bringing nonprofits into the world. He has an incubator for nonprofits. And we were still, we, we'd known each other for years, but we'd never talked about our work. And he asked me what I did at MIT. I'm now at the Max Planck Society in Berlin, based there with my science work. But he asked me, what did you do at MIT anyway? So I told him this story. And this was early COVID, so just two years ago. And he said, that sounds amazing. What are you tracking now with that machine? What, you must be talking about the pandemic and George Floyd and all these important issues. And I said, we're not tracking anything. It went onto the shelf because the graduate students graduated. The graduate student who you saw talking, the chief scientist on the project, had gone off to Dartmouth to start his own AI lab. And basically, we just moved on to other projects. So my friend, whose name is Andrew Stern, said, well, I bring nonprofits into the world. Why don't we create a nonprofit that rebuilds that machine because we need it right now. We need to hear all the voices, not just a few voices. The public sphere is broken, the public square. We need to fix it. So he convinced me to do this. I said my one condition was if the scientists co-founded it with us, the scientists at MIT and Dartmouth, both labs agreed to co-found it. And so we created this organization that used to go by a different name because humanity in the early days, and it's still that name on our very small website, but we're in the process of doing our branding and marketing and we'll soon have a website for our new name, which is Public Mind. I always have loved that phrase. It was used a lot in American history. James Madison liked to talk about the public mind when he was talking about the future of the United States. Modern writers like Noam Chomsky have used it a lot, other writers, as a way of talking about the way we sort of think collectively. And we didn't think we could get the name for our, for our company trade market, but we had a really good law firm and they negotiated it and we now have the name Public Mind. And, so we, and then we went out and got funding and this slide deck, as I said, was the vehicle we used to fund it. So I'll continue with the slide deck now. Okay, so this is another example of an article we did with Electome where we looked at a 
public event that wasn't about the election, but people reacted to it politically on Twitter. And as you'll see, Clinton followers responded to this terrible attack on a gay disco in Florida, saying that it was all about guns and LGBT issues. And Trump followers said it was all about terrorism and immigration. So you can see the two different groups having completely different takes on the world. We did many articles like this. Our mission is that we are going to provide powerful new insights that will drive social transformation by reaching all of these entities and then by, by in effect, the public at large. These are some of the early themes we thought about doing when we had this um, slide deck put together, but we're now thinking more about, for example, pandemics, climate change, and some of the other issues that we're talking about today. Um, we'll be revealing hidden narratives under these headings, questions that you wonder, okay, we seem really divided on race, but are there initiatives that have support across the lines dividing us? Can we find those in our analysis? Same goes for all these categories. This is where we see ourselves in the information market on this matrix between trend spotting and deep insights, so relatively superficial and deep, public good versus private for profit. We're up there in the right, doing public good with deep insights. And this is how we see the product evolution going. We start with Twitter, we add other platforms, we possibly bring in news content that we compare with what the public is saying, and then we move on to additional languages and countries. First language we're moving to after English is Spanish. Second language, probably Japan, because Japan is the, are the most, uh, by far, the heaviest users of social media in the world. And I have a lot of good connections in Japan that will help us make that happen, I hope, as well. Um, and this is sort of the big picture. We hope that public mind plus innovation will help us build a healthier, more positive public square. And this is too complicated for me to go through, but it's basically a theory of change that we think will allow public mind to really make a difference in the public square. And so just a status report. Um, this, is our, this is our team of founders. Um, so my big challenge after we got funded was finding a chief technology officer who was good, who would work for what nonprofits can pay, which is not the same as what people in the for-profit world pay. And finally, after several months of looking, about six weeks ago, we found a terrific chief technology officer named Agata Ciesielski, who is also simultaneously now a White House fellow in the Biden White House as a tech fellow there. And she's also b going to be building our technology. And we're in conversations with a bunch of different universities about doing the build inside a university of the first product, the first version of the technology, and then we'll take it out of the university and begin producing our products. But having built it with scientists who are at the cutting edge of the science is important to us. So we'll probably have an uh, announcement soon on which team we're working with. Um, and with that, that's the idea for Public Mind. I'd love to have a conversation and take your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Bill. We'll start the dialogue with Chema Alonso and Bill Powers. We'll do it both in Spanish and English, if you agree. Bill understands Spanish very good, but he prefers to communicate in, in English, and both Chema and myself speak English. So I will ask you in English <coughs> or Spanish. And of course, uh, you can ask in, in a language. I know that at the beginning there have been some problems with the some issues with the translation that has that has have been solved. Uh, Chema, you always speak about a humanistic agenda that can move the boundaries. This is the expression that you use, and you claim uh, you ask the governments to increase the individual freedoms to improve people's lives. In the case of companies, I don't know. Maybe there's a point of view like Bill's one, uh, inspiring positive to make technology strengthen te um, democracy. So what do you think about this project as a, as a technologist, as an entrepreneur, uh, to measure the impact of algorithms on the democratic living, uh, to raise people's voices, to find common ground, uh, and eventually to, find, to solve many problems caused by social media and their polarization effects? Well, first of all, it's a great honor to be here and to be able to enjoy 
this project, I always say that hackers, what we do is to bring uh, the technology boundaries beyond. And companies have the obligation of making people's lives be better in societies where they work. Third mic, let's see. Companies have the obligation of making people's lives better in these societies where they work. And regarding technology, it's not be, but many people think that technology has to be humanistic. And this means that it has to make people's lives better. And we need to apply all the values that we want for societies and people through technologies so that people's lives are better. In this specific project we are seeing how technology can help society, uh, the voices of society um, reach the decision makers so that they can improve their lives. The ones that have to uh, make decisions can improve people's lives and uh, this has a great value because if we don't know what is making people unhappy, that would be a serious problem. So I strongly believe that technology, the technology progress, uh, makes people's lives better. I'm not afraid of them, and I'm not afraid of AI or robotics or things like that. As far as we are mature enough to put people first, people's lives first. And I think that this is what we have to do. Thank you very much, Chema. Uh, uh, what you're doing, in a way, is fixing some of the problems caused by social media, so that they, ca they can keep on uh, making uh, a very good living without changing much. Um, you're helping governments uh, understand you know, the public square, uh, but in a way, you're creating an incentive for them not to regulate. Um, this is just a, you know, a, a, a very critical mm -hmm. uh, possible understanding of, of your project. Is there like a second step where you're not just elevating the voices of citizens and connecting you know, the real concerns of citizens expressing social media with business, with government, so they can make better decisions understanding everybody's concerns, mm -hmm. but you're also helping them realize how they could change, transform, their business models or their regulation. Yes. So they don't depend on independent providers like you. Right, great question, Jose. So my answer would be that we are, we are indeed doing something that we wish the businesses had wanted to do themselves, which is share all of our voices with all of us in a way that's intelligent and useful and that moves democracy forward. But that's not how capitalism works. You know, it's not the model. They were never going to survive as a startup, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever, if that was their goal. You have to be a nonprofit, in essence, to, to have this. I don't want to say we have a pure goal, but we do have a very pro-society, pro-humanity goal. And that's really the only way you can focus on the voices rather than on the money that can come from the voices. And so we feel that what we'll be doing if we succeed, and you talked in the present tense about things we're doing. We're not doing them yet, but soon. Um, I think that we will be demonstrating to those companies that they have more riches and treasure than they even realize in the voices themselves. That they were in a sense shortchanging us as a public, the global public, by not treating it as the democratic public square, but rather as a place where a lot of people are talking about things that can produce profits for them in particular, and for advertisers and other people. Nothing wrong with profits, that's what drives our society, but there is a piece of this that has been missing for too long, which is that this is literally how we collectively, and everybody out there beyond this building, is actually having conversations to resolve issues in our lives. And those conversations matter for their own sake and for what the people are saying. And we haven't emphasized that. So we're trying to bring that emphasis in and show everybody, including the companies, why don't we pay more attention to this as the public mind rather than just as a bunch of sources of profit, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and Chema, hablando precisamente de... And Chema, speaking about the possible biases in digital technology, 
one of the projects that you fostered in order to fight against discrimination um, coming from people or groups is the uh, campaign How Care Women in order to correct the bias information that for centuries we've been seeing when thinking that some uh, careers are uh, just for children, oh, sorry, just for boys and other are, and others are for girls. So what you've tried is that models are both for boys and girls and to have models that are clearly inspired in technology so that, as you've said uh, in, your, in, in your initiative, we have hacker women, uh, models to, to be role models, models to get excited. Well, the truth is that this project that started, I usually say as, uh, as a personal tantrum, I asked my daughter what she wanted to, to be when she, grew, when she grew up. I asked her if she wanted to be an astronaut. She said, no, that's a boy's career. And that really annoyed me because she was like seven or eight years old and in her head she thought that there were uh, f um, careers for boys and for girls. And sometimes it's difficult to know where this bias comes from. So we decided to launch this campaign, Hacker Women, in order to attract uh, roles and models for every girl. And like one year and a half ago, I opened a request to fix all this with uh, AI. To, today, the problem that we have with algorithms is that we are not creating algorithms where the, where the um, setter didn't, uh, was putting his knowledge there to focus on learning algorithms, the knowledge of which comes from the information that the algorithm learns. So it's difficult to know how they've learned. In order to explain all this, it's like if, you were, if they're going to show what's a cow, well, they have four legs, it has uh, um, horns, it has um, stains or whatever, and we do not learn this way. They say, you go to a farm and they say, hey, that's a cow. And you learn what a cow is. So we are being brought to AI. I mean, the AI is brought to data and we say, learn. So in the case of uh, Google and Microsoft, they are the ones that I've been opening the request with. They have created a translator, the, trans the Google and Microsoft translator. They've done it creating AI that has been trained with books that have been translated in the last 100 years. So this brings AI to learn that there are professions with a gender. So if you ask to um, translate a judge or nurse or engineer or secretary, the translator, although you do not give the gender, will include it. If you say, for example, the judge told a nurse to take care of the engineer, it, he, it would translate um, in Spanish what he has just said with genders in the words. And this has been subtly included in the translator's algorithm and it reaches boys and girls minds and they eventually think that there are occupations with a gender. So I think that we have to pay attention to how we are designing the technology algorithms today because this is happening uh, to everybody. I mean, you navigate on, uh, on a social media, social media, you read a newspaper, you browse on the internet, and this information is used so that a machine learning uh, algorithm is creating insights about you that are labels that you never see, and they will um, affect the information you will have access to, the famous bubbles that will um, mediatize the recommendation, the connection recommendations that you'll receive on the internet. So algorithms that we don't know how they work are defining what's going to be your life like in the future and we need to pay attention to all this. I think that deeply there is a convergence of both projects, of, uh, including the first, the main sentence, uh, algorithms and uh, responsibility. And Bill, I wanted to go back to your book. I strongly recommend it, although we, we don't have Blackberries, uh, Hamlet's Blackberry. It's a great book that makes us think about the future of digital technology. In our terms of history, how has society adapted to these um, shocks, to these changes where we are overwhelmed, overwhelmed by information, where it seems that we don't have control on our lives, on the kind of society we want? 
this loss of mm, trust on, in, on institutions it sh really shows that there's a transition ongoing. So do you have any historic role models that can be useful uh, to think on this, uh, this task? I wrote, it came out in 2010, Hamlet's Blackberry, as Jose said, was an early effort to co sort of push back against the digital revolution on human grounds, on behalf of individuals, families, children, sort of what Chema was saying. Um, and what I did was, I'm very, I've always been very interested in history, and so I went back to seven moments in the evolution of human society where a new invention came along that shook up everything and really made it feel like society might be exploding or coming apart. And this has happened a lot through history, and then how people reacted to it and basically put it to constructive use. So the first one is the alphabet in ancient Greece, when it arrived in ancient Greece. Socrates himself, one of the brightest people who's ever lived, arguably said, don't use the alphabet, it will destroy your mind. We should only have oral communication. And of course, the, he was wrong. Socrates was wrong. The alphabet has had amazing effects. Then move forward through other uh, technological changes in the 19th century when um, the telegraph came and people were sending their words electronically across the oceans and around the world. There was an incredible panic about how this was destroying families. It was destroying the workplace. There were psychiatrists in New York City who only treated people who were having nervous breakdowns because of the telegraph. Okay? Everybody thought it was like possibly the end, not everybody, but some of these people thought it was like the end of the world, the telegraph. Of course it wasn't. With time and with constructive thinking and conversations like this, I would say, we do figure it out. And I think we're on that path now. And the beauty is that the public is participating because of all these voices. Technology is one of the main things we talk about on these platforms. And so everybody can join in, hopefully, having this conversation about how to get beyond the place where we're polarized, where we're hating each other, where we're not fixing problems like climate change more quickly enough, and so on. Thank you. Chema. So Chima, this model that Bill speaks about, about getting into a platform to analyze every piece of information, to raise the conversation, so to speak, to clean the noise, to make every voice to be heard, would this be possible in Europe? From something that you've also discussed, and it's a very important discussion, this the per, uh, personal data protection, privacy, etc. So should we should we make a European translation of this project? Well, I think that human beings and citizens have to decide what we want to do with information, with our information. So the evolution that we're, we're doing in inter on the internet with the famous Web3 where we're giving the user the control of uh, his information and data so that he's the owner of everything that he generates on the internet and he decides who can create tags, insights, who can use them. This brings us to the future that we will have to have in Europe, of course, in Europe. If uh, citizens want their information to be used in order to raise their opinions, well, of course it will be done. In fact, Europe is a place where Twitter is especially relevant. Uh, in Telefonica, we are including it in every service we have because the opinions and recommendations and knowledge that they generate on what's happening uh, currently I mean, we are a company that has TV, and TV is um, hot news. And I think that, well, of, of course, we can bring this to Europe, and I hope it is brought to Europe. I'm very excited about having public mind eventually have a foot on the ground in Europe, because I think in the Internet age, Europe is the conscience of the Internet now. I mean, you are having conversations about privacy and regulation, the need for regulation, and the need to stand up on behalf of humans that are, is not being had elsewhere in the world at this level. And it makes sense that it should happen in Europe. I, this is where the printing press took off and where similar conversations happened, and the printing press caused all kinds of wars, and then it was sort of, we figured out that books are a good thing, and... Um, and we can move forward positively. And so I'm excited, I hope, fingers crossed, if we succeed as a startup, that we'll wind up here sooner rather than later. In Spain, we made up the word of liberal in the sense of tolerance. So I think that this is very important for this uh, joint digital future. 
to let's open the conversation in order to to see your remarks your questions please say who you are and go to uh, and ask a question that ends up with an interrogation mark or a brief remark okay and I know that there are questions on streaming so if you just make a sign hay que hacer una pregunta Chema, no sé si, si queréis preguntaros Chema, I don't know if you want to ask any questions as, uh, before we receive any questions so, do you have any, any questions? yeah, thank you, thank you very much we have a question there I think that that mic is not working English, Spanish So, how to, so, sorry, can you introduce me? Yeah, Emilio, I know you. I'm Emilio Luque. I'm a university professor. So, how to avoid the, sorry, uh, the mic is not working very well. Hello, again? Yeah, hello. Emilio Luque, I'm a professor at the university. I wanted to ask how to avoid the problem of the explicit things the voices that are formulated in every conversation you find that there are people that listen and it is very important that is not registered on the uh, on the processing of this text that we have on twitter or if we get close to um, a live conversation the ones that speak loud are the ones that will listen but the ones that are listening and not speaking are equally important. How can you register that in your technology? How can you inform the ones that are listening? To the listeners, in a way. And how, well, do we, how do we take them into account? How do we measure? Yes, so it's a problem that we haven't certainly haven't solved. I'm interested in that very much. We are interested in that as a team. We have talked about it. There are, I think, a huge percentage of people on Twitter are in that category, as you suggest. And we're not just doing Twitter. But I do think that there are going to be ways to get people like that involved in talking, or at least responding to what they are engaging with without themselves having to use their voices, where you could survey people and say, what are the conversations you're following as a person who's on X platform? What conversations matter most to you? Which voices that you're listening to are the voices that matter the most to you without having a retweet or a comment to measure that? I think there might be ways to do that. It would be a sort of a side project that's a new kind of polling that we could try. Um, but it is a hard problem. Um, it connects to the idea that the small voices, the people who do speak up, but only have a few followers, need to be heard too. But fortunately, those people are in our data. The people you're talking about are not in the data. And it's a research frontier, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Uh, my, I'm, I'm Mark Tessel. I work in BBVA as a global talent. Um, my comment will be a bit reflective, but also there will come, that will be the question. So um, I think um, you have very strong uh, algorithms and you measure uh, how, people, uh, how people think and how people will uh, act. But uh, even though it's now it's non-profit, um, I think the technology is there and it can be done by, I mean, on profit, by corporations. And I think um, if you do this job, you can't have um, one customer because you want one party to gain. I mean, you can't give the same service to two parties because you want one part. I mean, each party wants to win. Mm -hmm. And so, and there is another side of this story. Now, um, like black hat hackers, um, like companies like counterintelligence companies pay a lot more, a lot more to black hat hackers. And there is an incentive for black hat hackers to like uh, counter, counter like um, answer. Like if you go, uh, if you check uh, web, 
you see like how to like uh, distort Twitter, how to create trends, and so. And I think then eventually there 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 will be a need for um, identification, like are you real or are you not? But then this process is counterintuitive because here people are really concerned about privacy and I think like many people don't know about metadata, IP, different um, um, like a lot of technical terms. But once they know, I think they will find pretty scary in my mm -hmm. opinion. Um, like how do you see it in like 20, 50 years? I mean, it's not like, I don't want to ask a big question, but there are uh, like other sides of this of this story. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So we, we got this question a lot when we were fundraising for our idea. And our answer was the same answer today, which is there are all kinds of issues in social media. It's really a very complicated, messy place. Lots of troublemakers. Lots of people trying to undermine the idea that it's a public square for good and so forth. They want it to be a public square for bad, basically. And um, very hard to identify those people sometimes. But we had one experience with the Electome that I think was relevant. We noticed early on that we were getting a lot of tweets that were very similar to each other. This is before anyone talked about Russian bots or anything. And we decided to create a bot detector that we added to our machine early on that got rid of everything that was, looked like it was a bot. If it was close to possibly being a bot, we eliminated the tweets. And after the election, when it came out about the Russian intervention in the US election and that they had used all those bots, we went back to all of our data, to the raw data that we had pulled in and looked to see if we had been taken advantage of. And it turned out that the bot detector worked. <laughs> our data was really, really clean. We didn't have most of those Russian bots in the data. And there was basically a fix that we found early on, intuitively realizing this is a problem. And I think there's going to be a lot more development. That's an important, important area that scientists and technologists and companies obviously are working on now and there'll be a lot more work on it. There are wonderful institutes of disinformation already, misinformation, disinformation. Stanford has one, Oxford has one that we're going to, we hope, if they're willing to work with us, we'd like to partner with a couple of those institutions so they can alert us to narratives and conversations and bad actors that are showing up in their d data immediately so we could have a kind of a real-time connection because we're not going to have that as part of our mission that we're in charge of finding bad actors, at least in the beginning. But it's a super, super important question and challenge for us. And finally, I would say that you mentioned sort of identity and trusted identity and known person future. I think we are heading to that place. I, I think it will be a good thing when we can be known by a platform who we are. Maybe we can go by a different name publicly and be anonymous, but that the platform knows we're a real person because that is a fantastic way to eliminate not real people from participating. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of that as we go forward. I'd like to ask Chima what he thinks about this um, internet without anonymous parties. I would like to skip this question, but anyway. Twitter was created with um, anonymity because they wanted to have a free speech platform and they didn't want to um, prosecute or to chase people because of their ideas in countries where they could be chased. And this is why it is a, such a good election to be a public place, to include people's voices. Well, of course, we've seen how social media have been used in order to polarize the world with negative actors, even with uh, campaigns, campaigns that have been set in order to create ideas in people. And I always, I always tell the case of the mannequin challenge, the mannequin challenge where you have to stay still, uh, full company, um, have, you, have you done this, the mannequin challenge? Well, that was just a trend that was in social media because researchers needed information to train the cognitive services of 3D view with pictures. They wanted to be um, able that uh, AI saw a flat picture and they were able to create 3D and they needed uh, data and they created a trend. Of course, there can be uh, actors that follow these trends in order to um, include ideologies, etc. In, in fact, 
Re to react quickly to an ideological trend in Twitter, I don't think it's a good election for any um, governor because uh, I think that some maybe this can can come from something that has happened on the news, etc. But knowing all this, knowing that uh, we have the black hackers that you have said, the disinformation, misinformation actors. And there are many people that do not give an opinion that silent majority that exists in every country knowing that we have the ideology bubbles knowing that well I tried to use Twitter for other kind of actions that are more focused on my professional side rather than my personal side with all this we can get good information, a good pulse of what's happening in society and connecting uh, with institutions. And I always put an example, an example of how important this is. In Spain, we had a problem because we were starting to have a lot of malware, a lot of uh, criminality, people that stole accounts and small amounts of money, um, SMS um, scams, etc. But people uh, didn't report about it, and as far as they did not report about it, there was no there was no information, and it seemed to be a very small problem. We always said, go there and report on it. Let's say that there's a problem with information. So this is a good way to have this information without the need of having a registry where you need to include all these opinions. Thank you very much. So let's continue with your questions and remarks. So, Bill, as we receive more questions, where, where are you going with this project? Um, um, how do you see it you know, in five years' time? Well, I'll tell you my dream for five years' time, which is that um, we have developed um, a team that is very skilled. Well, first of all, we're working with multiple platforms, multiple languages in different parts of the world five years from now. Hopefully Spain, other parts of Europe, as I mentioned, Japan, certainly Latin America. Um, we have a team that is putting out a regular stream of reports of all kinds. So um, data visualizations, written reports, the way journalists do, basically public discourse analysis that has already developed an avid audience in the media, but has now acquired a popular audience within five years, hopefully earlier, the way that polls did after, in the United States, George Gallup invented the American polls that defined the 20th century, basically. How can we measure public opinion week to week? I grew up reading his polls, or his company's polls, in the newspaper every week. There'd be the Gallup poll. It was the public mind. We would like to be playing that role but measuring people's voices in many different languages, and we're having a global conversation, so sharing it across languages, across cultures. So we're not just reporting American voices to the American public, but to people everywhere. We're not just reporting Spanish voices to Spaniards, but to people everywhere, and basically begin to view the global public as a global mind, and track where it's going, day in and day out, objectively without taking any sides. That's also a very important part of our mission. We're not on any side of any conversation. We're just hearing them all. Sometimes Bill says that uh, one of the professions of the future is to, to analyze the public speech, as a public speech analyzer, oh, but uh, about every public speech or what someone says. No, both. Well, I think that one of the things that will create a disruption in the full analysis of information that we have are the AI algorithms. When we speak about, well, I was speaking about the translator, and besides the bias that I was saying, it shows the power that the learning algorithms have and the AI systems in order to use massive data. Today, we are speaking about algorithms like GPT-3 or GPT-4 or Darwin, etc., that are helping us use all the information uploaded on the internet to train AIs. We see that the bots 
are done with deep face with the real people embedded with the AI algorithms based on massive data and of course they are performing these uh, speech analysis and it is like the interstellar movie where they have this sarcasm level and the level of uh, humor, the, the, the mood that they want to include. I think that it will arrive, all this will arrive and we will suffer a disruption in three or five years with AI that will be much bigger than what we can think of. Of course we'll have AI bots that will be uh, tweeting uh, in order to create trends and there's something that was amazing and t this is a study that has been published in March where they had fake people created with AI and real people and they asked uh, 500 people to see whether they were able to recognize them or not and surprisingly they were right in 48 percent of the time so if it had been a monkey with his eyes closed um, pushing a button he would have um, been 50 percent right and if they told them if they were right or wrong, they reached up to 52%, a little bit higher. But the surprising was a third test, where they saw the face of the fake person, or the real person, and they asked her to introduce a ratio from 0 to 7 to see how trustworthy this person was. A cognitive service that we have um, that is prejudiced without knowing this person, to, without knowing whether this person is real or not, what level of trust they conveyed. And surprisingly, people preferred uh, fake people much more. People that were, had been created by AI. So we're moving towards a funny word, world, I would say. I do think that it's amazing and wonderful that we're living through a time where science fiction has had such an incredible explosion. And, you know, so much of the great content on television and in the movies is sci-fi. And it's interesting because it seems like more and more it's sci-fi about the present, in a way, but it's dressed up in the future as it always is, but it's because we're intensely exploring where this present is taking us. And I think that has to be a good thing, especially the darker it is in a way, the better, because it means we're confronting Correct. the dark side. Yeah. So I would like to go a bit further about what Chimons was saying. Mm -hmm. Something associated with sarcasm is irony. So what about those voices uh, that would basically bring to the conversation is irony. Yes. Irony is very connected with humor, yeah. uh, with creativity. How do we measure uh, voices full of irony in terms of parts of the public mind? Right, so this gets, that's great question of sentiment um, in public discourse and AI's ability to detect accurately sentiment. And when we did the project, the Electome, we looked at all the sentiment analysis algorithms that were available and all the efforts that were being done, in, mostly in scientific labs on that front, and we decided it was all terrible and we didn't use any of it in the project because it wasn't trustworthy. Sentiment analysis was really bad. That has changed. It has gotten a lot better. The same scientist you saw in the film who talked about all the things he did for our machine, he was a skeptic at that time. He is now converted that there, are so, there is some sentiment analysis that we can really do that is solid. Irony, however, <laughs> is a real challenge because the more successful irony is, the less, in a sense, obvious it is in, 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 in just the words. It's like the best irony is subtle in a way. And I would say it's accurate to say that AI doesn't really have a lot of subtlety yet in terms of language. It's learning how to mimetically or, you know, by copying the way people write in books to write good novels and short stories that GPT-3 can do that and feels like it's a story. But it's not the same thing as the computer itself mastering irony. We're not there yet. So I guess my answer is we've made a few steps forward, but we have a long way to go to understanding that stuff. And we're going to be, at Public Mind, we're going to be very cautious about sentiment and not, assume, not take large guesses on what people's sentiments are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think he's being ironic. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we perform many tests with sentiment analysis and it's something that um, I'm excited with. 
It's true that it can help you create better technology if you know how to measure the, f the sentiment that uh, you were going to put on the AI has. But today, it's difficult to find a good AI with a sentiment analysis. The good thing, or one, one important thing that people have to understand is that each AI is different. It depends on how it has been trained. You can have a cognitive ser service of co co sentiment analysis of Google or Microsoft and they can be totally different. I always put the example that with just a comma, uh, with, the, with the word hacker in a sentence, it can be either positive or negative. And I think that it is very difficult for, for, the, for people, but it's true that they are improving. I have a team that creates crazy ideas, that we test things. And one of the things that I wanted to do and that I'm going to introduce, and what I'm going to present is that something that I'm going to present at the end of this month, is how toxic for you it is to follow some people on Twitter because of the sentiment analysis that it causes in you, that his tweets have, what I call annoyed.com. Don't follow these people. And I'm going to present this. We've done this with Spanish politicians and results are really funny about the sentiment analysis. Yeah. Projects of um, partisan organizations, very legitimate projects, you know, to advance a certain uh, cause. Um, would you be willing to, to work with them, to offer them your advice on understanding social noise, understanding citizens' voices, or is that something that really escapes you know, your purpose? We have talked about that. We feel that anybody who wants to see our work is welcome to it, and we want, I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we want to get it out to as many people as we can. We're hoping that people on both sides of any divide will be interested in what we're reporting because we are trying to, ca we will be trying to capture all the voices. However, we're not planning to partner with anybody who has a cause and help them move their cause forward because th then we ourselves would become b biased in a sense. In fact, when we were pitching using the, those slides for funding, we had a number of funders who said we would love to fund you if you'll just make it about this cause that we're involved with and dedicate it to whatever, climate change or whatever the cause was. And we always said no. It was hard to say no to money, but we said no because we don't want to be on any team of any cause. We just want to be on the side of all the voices. And so that's my caveat, that we wouldn't be partnering with people to help them move it forward. Even if there are public causes, not just private interests? Well, for example, like the Ukraine war or something? Or, you know, fighting climate change with good scientific well, data? I, we feel that, in effect, we'll be helping people by just making the public square visible and understandable to the people, for example, in the climate change movement. So in that sense, we'll be helping them, but we won't be getting on their, on their train and going to the destination with them. We're not an active partner, but we, what we provide, we hope, will be helpful to anybody who is trying to move a cause forward because you're understanding the public mind. There's no better way to move a cause forward than having a grasp, we believe, of the public mind. So in a way, you're urban planners. You're creating the public square. You're making sure that that infrastructure yeah. exists. We're making sure that it's, that it's intelligible and that it's not this opaque, um, frankly, somewhat destructive public square that we have today, that it's one that is constructive because we can all be there in effect through analysis and data and really understand what's happening there and then make up our own minds. I mean, right now the public square is as if you had walked into one of those coffee houses in the 17th century and you really weren't even allowed to, uh, to be in all the conversations or to have access. And I'm sure there was some of that, but the point of the coffee house, as I understand it, in the 17th century, the beginning of the modern public sphere, was that you got up in front of the whole coffee house and talked about what your views were, and then people would write articles about it and respond and debate you. And now it's just all these were frag fragmented into bazillions of coffee houses, and we feel that's not healthy. Thank you. Sí, por favor, gracias. Yes, please. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. I'm Victor Calvo-Sotelo from the uh, um, Digital Digitales Associations. I wanted to ask a question. If Elon Musk is uh, able to buy Twitter, two questions. What do you think he will do, and what do you think he should do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yeah. yeah. go first. I have my I own mean, opinion also. You no know, <laughs> my, I'm biased because Jack Dorsey, the former CEO, was a supporter of our project at MIT. And that was a wonderful gift to us. And so when he stepped down, I had a bit of sadness about that. But, you know, it's a marketplace. And Elon Musk is nothing if not creative. Um, he's unpredictable, he seems to be narcissistic, he has a lot of issues, but he is a creative person and he has brought some really valuable things into the world. And some of the things he has said about Twitter and what he wants to do with it sounded very promising to me. Some of them I had concerns about, but other things seemed very creative. And so we can't control whether or not this is going to happen, but if it does happen, I think at the very least it's going to be interesting and we'll see you know, where it goes. That's my take. Ah, muy bien, muy bien. <laughs> eh, bueno, la verdad es que... Well, the truth is that it's quite similar. Well, first of all, Elon Musk and his um, CV um, is a role model. I mean, he has created disruption, he has created things that have made sense, and that uh, these things have made him create, create empires and companies. So the first thing he has, or the first thing that I have is a great respect for his work. What do you think he is going to do? First of all, he's really vocal about free speech. This has entailed many problems for him. And the last timeline that he, uh, that the current CEO of Twitter uh, put and that he ended up with a poo emo um, emoji, that's an example that he is in favor of uh, free speech. This has been one of the flagships for Twitter for a very long time. And I think that what he can do and what it would make sense to do is something that also Jack Dorsey is doing, to go to the next generation of social media, Web3, distributed, etc., where people have their data under control. I think that Twitter <coughs> can be, and it is something that is in many people's minds, it can be this uh, identity, global identity wallet or platform that can be connected to every platform in the Web3 architecture. And it would be really easy to evolve. Because you have an app with an identity, with your information, etc. And the move that they are doing in terms of integrating an NFT and, or avatars as part of your data could go this way, but it's just a speculation. I mean, it's just an opinion. Yeah, please. Hello, I'm Vanessa, I'm a student. And speaking about the project, I would like to know, well, I understand that there are very social topics and topics that are socially relevant, but I want to know if there's is something static. I mean, if these topics are static or they can change, you include other topics, you remove some of them, etc. Question, you're asking how we're going to decide which topics to focus on and then move on to new ones or mm -hmm. we don't have a total blueprint for that yet. We have a list of sort of seven topics that we're very interested in right now to be our beginning narratives, you know, or subjects that we're tracking the narratives about on initially on Twitter and see how that goes. If those are successful and draw an audience, those can continue being tracked because it's all about having a machine that automates it. And then we can move on to new ones that we build the algorithms and, and the tracking and sort of hopefully it gets bigger and bigger as we move forward. And we're not throwing out topics. We're just adding new topics and growing sort of the body of work. That's what I hope we do. Obviously, there will be topics that fade away and that are of less interest because the world has lost interest in them. And maybe we, after a time, we just put those aside. But it doesn't cost a lot of extra compute once you've developed the system and are tracking the data to keep doing that. So there wouldn't be always a huge incentive to do that. So I think the idea is constantly growing the number of topics and issues that the world is facing that we're on top of and, and moving forward with new languages, new countries and new platforms, as I said. So I think that we are at the end of our session. I would like to say, no, th there's a last question. We have uh, another minute. It was Ramon Palanco. I'm an entrepreneur. It was brilliant. Uh, my question is, who's the final customer of a public mind or the public administration for understanding better the citizens' needs 
uh, the media for understand what, they, what are the topics they have to uh, uh, write about or I would like to know more about, about this. It's all of the above, but the final customer really is democracy. The final customer is our democracy and in countries that aren't democratic, maybe also having an impact in those countries and they move toward democracy. So the idea is making the public mind visible to the public so that we understand ourselves and to the extent that democracy has problems, we have new ways of moving forward because we can understand what the people are thinking, what various aspects of the public want, and how to move forward. It is a massive, massive ambition. I'm not pretending that we can do all of that and make it easy, but I feel like this is the moment to have that kind of ambition as we move forward because we want to show the world that we can do better than we're doing now with social media, which looks a little bit like a, like a disaster some days, and make it positive, make it constructive, and realize that public, the voices of the public are very rich material that we could all benefit from if we listen to it carefully. So thank you very much. I think that this is the best way to end up this uh, new cycle of Tech and Society together with Fundación Telefónica, with the social leaders with their humanistic agenda to improve technology so that it has a positive impact on our lives. Uh, to f live free and together, this is democracy and build weeks. We hope that you come back many times in Spain and to see how you approach it because eventually this is the project of a democracy, how it grows and we can all learn and we can all collaborate with you. Thank you very much, Chema. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you very soon. Thank you.